Okay, we'll continue proofs today. And one thing I'd like to point out, since the square root of 2 is irrational, is going to be on the test. Uh, going through what I would expect um, for you to do on the exam. Um, the idea of when you go through the proof, you know, the first thing you're going to have to definitely show is... Uh, say prove. Prove the lemma that you're going to use in here, that is, if n squared is even, then n is even. And then after that, you're going to go ahead and then prove radical 2 is irrational. And obviously, you're going to use the lemma. You need to state the definition of rational because you're going to use the definition of rationality to be able to do the proof by contradiction. The reason why I like this particular proof and do it a lot is because to prove the lemma requires contra contraposition. So you take the contrapositive and then prove that directly. So you do a direct proof, you use contrapositive. And then to prove the square root 2 is irrational with that lemma, you're going to have to use a proof by contradiction. And you have to strongly state definitions and know how to use that. So the other part of this is on detail, the idea that I want what I want you to be able to do on the, the detail level is don't write your proof assuming that you know I'm filling in all the blanks as the teacher who's grading this. What I want you to do is when you write these particular proofs, you write them with a level of detail that you could take this proof and hand it off to a classmate. They could understand it. They could follow it. You have enough detail for it to work for them. Uh, don't assume that your reader is an expert. Assume that the reader is at your level or a little bit below. So. Uh, there's that. Um, another question that was posted was uh, from the textbook homework and it was the idea of how can you prove that every odd number is the difference of two squares. And what's good about this particular statement is it covers a lot of different things is also what you also bring into play so one you would look at this and say well how in the world is this an implication well this is an implication because this is saying that is if n is odd then n is the difference of two squares so this is the implication this is my hypothesis over here is the conclusion. So if I'm going to prove this, I'm going to, if I do a direct proof, I would assume that n is odd and I would show that a natural consequence that must happen is that it's going to be equal to the difference of two squares. And what's nice about this is going through and we can tear apart kind of meanings. Like for example, what does it mean for n to be odd? That means it's twice an integer plus one. It's, it's not an even number. Uh, what does it mean for n to be the difference of two squares? Well, is is a word that means equals. Uh, difference means subtraction. Um, two squares. Well, good question is, what's a square? So when we look at particular definitions, if you don't know, for example, I don't know what odd is. Um, I don't know what a square is. If you don't know these things, there's no point in even starting off with you know, trying to even attempt the proof until you have enough background. If you don't know what subtraction is, if you don't know what equality is, none of this makes any sense at all. Don't try to memorize it, right? Memorization is absolutely worthless. You have to know it. You have to know these sorts of things. So what are some things that you need to know? Well, for example, what's a square? You know, square numbers, if I look at numbers, let's say the integers, the integers themselves, not using figures, right? An ellipsis just means continuation. 
the integers themselves are just simply collections of ones that successively become larger. You get an extra one each time. Now, just because we name them one, two, three, four, it does not change what they are. It is successively growing things, and I just throw another one in, throw another one in, throw another one in. So the fundamental thing that exists is the number one. We keep collectively putting more on it, and we might give them names like one, two, three. We have unique names up to 12. After that, 13 is 310. We talk about combinations of what they are. So as you're building these things up, you know, these are the integer numbers. Um, it kind of gets to the idea of what is a square. And when we talk about the squares like 1, 4, 9, 16, you might think of this as a, okay, 1 to the power of 2, 2 to the power of 2, 3 to the power of 2, 4 to the power of 2. But we use the word square. Why do we use the word square? We use the word square because what these things actually are. This is a 1. This is a 4. That's the 9, etc. right? These are physically, these numbers, as we look at them, are physically squares. If I want to, I have, what's, what is 9? What does 3 to the power of 2 mean? So it means I have three groups of 3. That makes a square. What's 2 to the power of 2? I have two groups of 2. That makes a square. What's 4 to the power of 2? That's four groups of four, right? That makes a square. So whether or not you use their figurate representation, we use this idea of a multiplication, which is multiple additions, or their physical shape, we name them based upon their physical shape. And so, for example, when we talk about things like, you know, what's a cube? You know, I might say that one cube, two cube. Why do we use the word cube? Because when I physically shape them, you know, that's a one by one by one, right? And there's a two if I would go ahead and make the shape out of this, right, where each of these corners is going to be, y is 8, well it's 2 cubed, which is 2 twos, which is the base, and I've got two of them, two layers, right? So the, the cubic numbers form physical cubes, the square numbers form physical squares. So what you can look at this and say, all right, we have the integers and in algebra. We also have things that are squares and algebra. And we can look at different things. And we've looked at them before. We've had things like a difference of squares, like you know, a squared minus b squared is actually, you know, a minus b times a plus b. We've tied we've had in algebra we've also had perfect square trinomials, right? Which is say a plus b, the quantity squared is equal to a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. Simpler versions are like a plus 1 squared, a squared plus 2a plus 1. And these were perfect square trinomials. This is a difference of squares. We have difference of cubes. And, but anytime you heard the word square, you should be starting in your head to think, what are what could they possibly be take, talking about? What are all the square things that I've I could possibly do. But this is just simply, you know, stuff you know that you could bring to bear to actually show our thing. If n is odd, then it's going to be the difference of two squares. So let's go ahead and do our proof. I'm going to use a direct proof for I'm going to go ahead and assume n is odd. All right? But assuming that n is odd is really simply going to mean that n is equal to 2k plus 1. And now comes the question. Always in the back of your mind, you're going to have this idea of what is my goal, right? My goal is that this is equal to a difference of two squares, which means I should have this sort of event, right? So my end goal that you keep in mind, you always have to keep track. I would like to have this somehow be the subtraction of two things, each of which are squared. Okay, um, I have 2k plus 1. It doesn't look anything like the first. But on the other hand, you know, 2k plus 1, and that's a square. It looks like it's kind of close to this, right? You, you kind of look at that, and you would say that, you know what? That looks close, 
the only thing it's missing would have been if it had a k squared, then I would have a square. And so if I would look at this and say, well, n being 2k plus 1, boy, if I had a k squared here, that would be a square because that would be just k plus 1, the quantity squared. But I don't have a k squared, and I just can't throw it in there. So what you would have to do is not just throw it, throw it in particular, just toss it in. You would have to say, I'm allowed to add nothing. But I'm going to pick a special nothing. I'm going to say that I'm going to pick k squared and then minus k squared. So I'm not adding anything at all. And then if I use my grouping property, I mean, sorry, grouping. If I use the associative and commutative property of the addition of integers, I could say that this is actually k squared plus 2k plus 1 and then minus k squared. Why would then I have, hey, look, that was my square. So n is equal to, that's a k plus 1, that's a thing squared minus, and then I have k squared. Hey, that's a difference of squares. So we're done. n started out as an odd, and it became a difference of squares just using algebra. So it works out. As long as I have an odd, I can get a difference of squares. It also goes back to the physical nature of the squares themselves. So you could sit there and look at this and say, how do I go from the number 9 to the number 16? Well, I do a plus 7. Where does that 7 come from? Well, I have my 9 here. That's one square, which is still that 9 there. But if I add another 3 and another 3 and then a 1, well, that's two 3s and a 1, right? So really, if I look at this, 4 squared, and I would subtract this 3 squared, if I throw, throw that away, what would be left? Two threes and a 1. In other words, the difference of two neighboring squares is simply 2k and the 1. So physically, we could also have shown it in a visual way by understanding what the physical interpretation of square numbers actually are. So that works out pretty well and we go through these proofs and you know, so that, that's an example of using a direct proof and all the five things that we need to remember from direct proofs from last was oh, can you prove trivially, can you prove vacuously, can you prove directly, can you do contraposition, can you prove by contradiction, so all of those still need to be there. So again if we're going to prove left implies the right conjectures You use, is it trivial? Or can you do a vacuous proof? Both of which are pretty rare. Then what I just used was a direct. Or we try contraposition, which is really just prove usually not the right implies not the left directly. That's normally what we try to do. We take the contrapo contrapositive and then just prove it. Normally the proof is going to be a direct proof. And the other one is contradiction, which is to show that you have the hypothesis and you do not have the conclusion and that ends up always being false because that is just simply the negation of wanting that to be a tautology. So we have these five techniques that we always use for implication to be able to go through it. Now on the other hand, when we look at uh, contraposition and contradiction, you know, what do they have? They have not the conclusion and the direct proof you assume the hypothesis. And so what are some typical proof mistakes? Um, the two big typical proof mistakes that happen are based on our two biggest fallacies, which are the fallacy of affirming the conclusion and Instead of saying the word affirm, we could use the word assume if we wanted to do that.
Because if I look back at this proof, what are we supposed to assume? We're supposed to assume the left-hand side, right, the hypothesis. We assume the hypothesis. And then you show that's a valid form of reasoning. What are we supposed to deny? We're supposed to deny the conclusion, and that's a valid form of reasoning. So if we go through here, typical things that you do is you affirm the wrong side. So it would be like on this problem, you say, well, I shall now assume that n actually is the difference of two squares. You can't do that. You've just used a fallacy. That fallacy normally gets a name called circular reasoning. But on the other hand, it's still just you've assumed the wrong thing. So it's a fallacy of assuming or affirming the conclusion. So that's the first big one. Uh, the second one is the fallacy of denying the hypothesis, right? Because you're supposed to negate the conclusion, not the hypothesis. And so that'd be like on this problem right here. You'd say, I'm going to prove this by saying, well, let's assume rather that n is even. Well, you just denied the hypothesis. That's a, that is a fallacy. You're not allowed to do that under reasoning. So those are the two big mistakes that people tend to do is they, they get, grab the wrong assumption. They assume the wrong thing or deny the wrong thing. Be careful. You affirm the, hy the hypothesis. You deny conclusions within valid forms of reasoning. Affirming the hypothesis is called a direct proof. Denying the conclusion is indirect, right? It's one term, but it's two types. You're either using contraposition or you're using contradiction. So that's the correct use. If you incorrectly do it, you fall under fallacies and it's wrong. You're not going to prove anything that way. Anything that you do is just meaningless. So the next thing I'll be talking about is well, let's move away from implication and look at other forms of conjectures that we'll try to prove.